All right. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Okay, so I've got a new mic set up. I've got my fish cam set up. So you can see um, things are just arranged a little bit differently today. Hopefully this is working well. Looks to me like the audio is certainly working. And what I'm going to do is not always show... Excellent, glad to hear that. So I'm not always going to have the, um, the fish cam up, but I will keep it there when it's not in the way, um, because I know you guys like that. Um, so if you have a, a favorite color preference for the um, for the, the aquarium, I can stop it at a, a given color. I did put some food in there for the fish, so it might be active today. So we'll see. All right, and I also, you may notice, um, I added space for the chat to appear when somebody makes a chat, so you can see the chat happening if you've got it in full screen mode. This should disappear after 30 or 40 seconds when it, um, after it was uh, put up there. So hopefully that's gonna be helpful and not distracting. And I'll try to make sure that the, the fish can is not distracting either, um, or at least not distracting in a bad way. Um, okay, with that, uh, I'm gonna get back to where we left off last time. So we have uh, one, and I guess before we get there, just a couple logistics. We have the, the homework assignment. I believe that's due um, Saturday night. Um, the first Moodle quiz sort of activity. This one's a feedback. Just let me know how things are going. That's going to be due tomorrow by midnight. Um, really, it should only take a few seconds. I'd love to hear your feedback, your honest feedback. Um, the only thing I'm going to do with the, the names is just simply say yes, this person participated, or no, he or she didn't. So um, in terms of the feedback, I'm going to keep it anonymous. I will read through what you say, but I'm not going to you know, be looking at, oh, that person was negative or whatever. Um, so please be honest. Give me your impression. Um, let me know what you think with that little quiz um, feedback poll activity. OK, um, so last time we were talking about sedimentation. <clears throat> And we had gotten it to a point where we were looking at how particles are, set, are settling out through the water column. If this y direction, that's the height or the, the depth of the reactor. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we're looking at that settling velocity going downwards while also the water is moving through the sedimentation chamber. So that's the um, really the important concept here. And so we were taking a look and we said that the, um, the height of the particle, of some given particle, if we set that equal to h, then we have a situation where um, we can design our reactor specifically to remove the very highest particle um, there is. Okay, keeping in mind that we have the hydraulic retention time uh, theta is equal to V over Q, we can end up designing our reactor and setting up a system where if we say that the, the particle that we're trying to settle, if it settles exactly at this parameter, at this rate, that speed, then it'll be completely removed. Okay, so I'm gonna take go up to the next slide and um, make this a little more clear just to hone in on that component of it. Okay, so and we'll, we'll bring them back to fish cam in a little while. All right, so what we have here, in terms of the, the settling velocity versus the critical settling velocity. I really want to make this clear what we're talking about between these two. Um, the critical settling velocity, this guy is what we've designed the, um, the reactor to have. Okay, So this critical settling velocity is the reactor design. So this tells us what velocity a particle must travel to be exactly removed by the system. 
So that critical settling velocity is the particle that starts up in this corner and ends, if we were able to draw a straight line here, this will end right at the, the other corner. Okay, so that's the trajectory, and just pretend that's a straight line here. That's going to be the trajectory for um, exactly v naught, that critical settling velocity. As the particle settles, water's flowing through, the particle is settling downwards. That's characteristic of our um, settling velocity there. Now, Vs might be equal to V0, or Vs, when we're looking at some random particle, maybe Vs is this guy, or perhaps it could be that trajectory. So we'll just say one and two here. So in terms of what Vs is, Vs is some particle that we are observing or predicting the speed at which it settles, okay? So if we have a system and we're solving for this critical settling velocity based on all those equations we derived, we can compare that to what the reactor is designed for. So if the reactor design here, V0, has a greater velocity than Vs, so a faster downward trajectory, then not all particles are removed. So that means V0 here is bigger than Vs1. So in that case, we see some particles are escaping. They hit the, if they hit the sidewall, we assume that they escape, right? So in that case, some of the particles under this condition will certainly escape. Some of them might be removed. You know, if a particle started right here, even if it's got a pretty slow velocity, it can still be removed, right? So even in this condition, some particles are expected to be removed. Now, if V0 is less than or equal to Vs, then all particles are removed because it's either Vs comes exactly the same as V0 and gets settled, or it's happening faster. Okay, so in, in terms of this, we would say V0 is less than or equal to the speed at which we saw these Vs, you know, these particles number two fall. Okay, does that make sense? Is there any um, issues with uh, this, these definitions and what that looks like? Please, please let me know if there's any confusion or uh, questions here. Even if you just kind of get it but not sure you get it, definitely let me know. Okay, so I think that's, that's about all I wanted to say. So there you go, you can have a fish can back. Um, I guess the, the last point I want to emphasize is when we take a look at... Okay. Uh, good question here. So just to make it clear, it's the slope that we're looking at. So when we're taking a look at these uh, particles and we have V naught here, um, if we take a look at the slope, the, um, yeah, so in terms of the, whichever is steeper, yeah, essentially we, we could look at the slope and that's, Fair, but really what we're looking at is just that downward component. So our settling velocity downwards is directly related to the slope, right? Because the, the flow going in the x direction here is constant. So if you have a bigger downward velocity, then the slope is steeper. So you're exactly right there. Um, this Vs going downward is really what we're comparing because you know, if that's the Vs for the that one that's basically at critical settling, I'll we'll just say this one's equal to V0, then this one over here has a smaller compared to a, a very rapid, a very large um, downward component of this, um, this vector. 
Okay, so looking at the slope, you're, you're essentially correct there. Um, but what mathematically what we're doing is using this, uh, um, just the, that downward component. But it sounds like you've got it. Okay, so then the last thing I want to emphasize then is really the, um, that derivation where we said uh, essentially V naught is equal to, um, I think it was, what did we say, Q over, let's just go back to make sure I'm, so we have HQ over V, and that transitions to Q over A. So HQ over V, and this is talking about if H is here, we've got a three-dimensional system, and we can imagine it like that as well. So if we're looking at this system where we have x here, h there, and I guess we'll just say z here um, in that direction, essentially we want to we want to take a look at this surface area down here because this surface area um, is is going to end up being important. So we'll say area here equals x times z, the way I've drawn it. And this is the, the surface area that we're looking at. Okay, so with that, we, we can notice, we describe the critical settling velocity as if a particle settles from the height and it settles down the full height during the course of the time it takes to go through the system. Okay, so we, we define V naught as the distance it has to go multiplied by the time. Uh, divided by the time, sorry. So distance per time, right? This is relatively straightforward, right? This is the distance it has to travel downwards and the time in which it does so. Um, that's a velocity, distance per time. So that's defining the reactor by those metrics. So what we can say is instead of just simply time, let's call it the hydraulic residence time how long the water stays in that reactor. So we still have H, this time we're going to divide it by theta because theta is just that. Now, we remember that theta is uh, V over Q is the volume divided by the flow rate. So when we put that into this, this uh, equation, we say V naught is equal to, since we're divided by theta, we can just invert it. We have H times Q divided by V. So that's where we got this portion that we were talking about earlier. So we have, we defined our settling velocity as that exact height traveled downwards in the amount of time it took for the water to travel to the edge. So here we have um, that definition. We write it out as H over theta we convert theta and we see it's h q divided by v. And now we also know that the volume is going to be h times x times z, right? That's the volume of this rectangle. So the volume here, and by the way, we could do this the same way if we said or is equal to h times um, pi r squared, the area whatever area term we're using here. Um, this is for a circular uh, circular reactor here. Either way, it's essentially V naught is equal to um, the air, oh, well, let me, let me slow down. Either way, the volume is equal to height times the area, right? And so that means if we rewrite the volume here as height times the area, we have height times Q divided by height times the area. So these heights cancel, and we're left with a final equation here, V naught equals Q over A. Um, 
Okay, so for a circular reactor, that's a good question. Um, and I'm going to erase this one little bit here to, to explain. So for a circular reactor, the question here is, wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be the X times um, the area? Now, if you had a cylinder uh, that looked like this, and you had water traveling through a cylinder like kind of like that, then yes, to get the volume you need this surface area times x. But that's not actually what we're talking about. Um, because in a circular reactor, instead, we've got the dimensions um, a different way. So instead, we have a cylinder that is standing upright. And we have flow essentially coming out the middle here in every direction. And so then if we take that cross section, we end up with this rectangle here um, that we're flowing and it parallels this system. It's just that, you know, in this uh, circular system, it would end up looking like um, this is a, a circle that's going either direction, you know, that's that would be the, <clears throat> the system. Okay, so hopefully you cleared that up. Great. I'm going to erase this mess a little bit. All right. Cool. So that's, that's what I wanted to highlight here is this derivation of the definition for critical settling velocity, it's important because that's what that tells us is as long as we know the flow, all we need is the area at the bottom. That area at the bottom of the reactor, if we know that and the flow, we know exactly how, how fast the particles need to settle in order to be settled. So that's really going to help our design to, to see it that way. Okay, so I have an example here for you. Um, so take a look, I'm going to read it for you and discuss it a little bit, and then um, we'll, we'll work on it together, let's see, okay, okay, so my next set of slides that, um, you know, this was finishing up from the last time, and I will, I will replace last lecture slides with these now that we've gone further. And then I'm going to bring up the next set of slides and we'll, we'll have space to solve this. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and start reading it, um, explain it, give you a moment to start working on it, pause if you'd like and all that. Um, and then we'll work it out on the next, uh, next page, the next set of slides. Okay, this is example 6.1 from our textbook. We have a drinking water treatment plant that uses a circular sedimentation basin to treat 3 million gallons uh, per day of river water, and then it gives the, the MGD um, conversion there. After a storm occurs upstream, the river carries often carries 0 0.01 millimeter silt particles with an average density of 2.2 grams per cubic centimeter, and the silt must be removed before the water can be used. The plant's clarifier or we, we use clarifier and sedimentation basin synonymously. So the, the plant sedimentation basin or clarifier is three and a half meters deep and 21 meters in diameter. The water is 15 degrees Celsius. And so then the questions are, A, what is the hydraulic retention time of the clarifier? So what is theta? And B, will the clarifier remove all of the silt particles from the river water? So part B is asking us to compare the Vs of the silt particles. And we're going to compare that versus what we know to be that um, critical settling velocity. OK, so take a moment, start thinking about how you could solve this, what pieces you need. I'm going to load up the next set of PowerPoint slides, and we'll go from there. Okay. 
So same question, and essentially what I'm doing is I've got it repeated here a little smaller, and then we've got a few um, parameters there to take a look at. So uh, we have a couple things from our uh, textbook lookup table at 15 degrees Celsius. We know our dynamic viscosity of water is 1.4, excuse me, 1.14 times 10 to the minus third kilograms per meter per second. The density of water is 999.1 kilograms per cubic meter. For part A, we're seeing what is theta, and for part B, we're comparing that V naught to V S to see will the clarifier remove all the soap particles. And we remember that our condition to say yes or no to that question is, is the settling velocity of the particle, V S, is that bigger or equal to the design velocity? So does it have the same or steeper slope than the critical settling velocity? All right, so now's a good time to pause or take a moment um, to try it on your own. So I will go ahead and begin working it out quietly at first, and then we'll talk through it. Okay, so a couple things here first. I've solved for Q and V now, so we're just about ready to solve for theta. A um, couple things to note is, first of all, I needed to convert um, uh, convert the flow rate into meters, and I went ahead with meters and seconds because I figure other units are also using seconds already. So. So when we, we know that a lot of our units are using meters and seconds, that's just a good uh, go-to to keep that. So we needed to convert three MGD to meter, cubic meters per second, and we said one MGD equals 0 0.0438, and so I just said three uh, MGD 
times that 0 0.0438, um, that's 0 0.0438 cubic meters per second per MVD. Um, so I made that relationship and I multiplied that, got 0 0.145 cubic meters per second. A volume, I did exactly like we were talking about a moment ago, where we needed the height times, and again, if you have any questions, it's always a good idea to envision the reactor, right? Go ahead and draw, draw the system. So we have a reactor there with a height, and they gave us a diameter, and for the for the area of a circle, we need pi r squared, and that's the same as saying pi times, uh, you can either do d squared over 4, or you could say pi times the diameter in half and square the whole thing, right? It's the same thing. So that's what I did. You probably saw me grab the calculator, and I came up with um, a volume of 385.9 cubic meters. So now we just need to say theta is equal to v over q. And if I come back to my calculator, we can see that we'll take 385.9 and divide that by our 0.145. And we get uh, 2,661 seconds. And we could convert that into um, a longer time unit, might make sense, um, but for the moment we'll leave it like that. So, you know, we could say divide by 60, that's 44 minutes, or basically three quarters of an hour. Okay, so that's the answer to part A. That's the hydraulic retention time. So then part B, go ahead and make some space. Part B here, we're gonna need some of the other pieces. Move the fish out of the way. All right, part B, we want to know, will the clarifier remove all the silt particles? We need to make use of this V0 versus Vs. So that means we, we need to know something about V0, and we need to know something about Vx. So we have all the information we need, and what I'm going to go ahead and do is solve V0, and we, we talked about this earlier, but this is going to be that Q divided by the area, right? So this is um, flow rate, so volume per time divided by area gives us distance per time when you sort out those units. I literally just double checked that in my mind because I, I assumed I had this right, but I never completely trust my memory, especially while I'm trying to talk and teach and all this. So I literally just did that in my mind to double check um, that I had these units correct and this was the right formula. This is such a simple formula that I expect you guys to be able to commit this to memory um, and to understand it kind of on that fundamental level. So I um, encourage you again to, to make sure that you know this um, for these problems. Okay, so with that, we, we pretty much know the area or can easily get it from what we already did. So this is going to be that flow rate, 0.145 cubic meters per second, divided by our area, which is pi times 21 meters divided by 2 squared. So V naught then will be equal to, calculator, so we had 21 times 21, divide that by 4, and multiply by pi. Now, did I, did I do pi last time? Maybe I left it out. Um, I think I may have left out pi from our equation. So what, 
you guys should have corrected me. Um, hopefully you are noticing in your own work that I did this wrong. Always, always feel free to tell me that I did something wrong. Um, it does happen, I do apologize, but at minimum it can help you see that problem solving, um, problem solving that happens live. So hopefully that's going to be useful. Okay, so the area, by the way, um, area equals 346. So I know that my previous answer was wrong. So I need to come back and fix that. So then our, our V naught then is going to be point uh, one four five divided by our area, which is three four six point four. Okay, so that's going to be four point two times ten to the minus four, essentially. Four point, we'll say one nine times ten to the minus four four uh, meters per second. Now, to me, this looks about right because I know that. The velocity terms are in um, meters and seconds, and it doesn't go very many meters every second. It's a, just a, a small fraction of it. Um, thank you uh, for, for the vol volume there. We'll update that. Um, so this looks about right to me. Um, so I'm going to update this guy. So 1,212.3, uh, we'll say, for the volume. And that means our, our hydraulic residence time should be a lot longer than um, given that. So let's do that real quick. And by the way, that looks totally correct to me because if I just simply forgot pi, then, um, and previously I had like 385, 385 times three-ish um, should be 12 something, right? So that that looks um, looks good to me. Uh, okay, and then this divided by like you just gave me 0.145. Okay. Thanks a bunch. Yeah, so like I said, keep me honest. If you, if you see something wrong, might as well might as well ask. So that's going to round to one. Okay. So with that, we have coming back to part B. Now that we've corrected part A, we have V naught, and now we need V S. And so with V S, we have to remember the equation that we derived last time regarding the, the sedimentation velocity given the different parameters about the particles themselves. So if you recall, we had the acceleration due to gravity, and then we had essentially the difference, and this is where the buoyancy is coming in, the difference between the density of the particle and the density of the water. So we have, let's see, the, I think it's the density of the water, or no, the density of the particle, minus the density of the water times the diameter of the particle squared divided by 18 times the dynamic viscosity of water. Okay, and double check me here. This is rho P minus rho, right? Not the other way around. Um, I think it was the other way around we'd get negative and that would mean we're floating. So that should be right. If it's only the particle is heavier than uh, heavier than the water. Okay, so here we need to start thinking, start uh, putting in our numbers. Um, but really, I guess first what we ought to do is say the rho particle. This was given to us as 2.2 grams per centimeter cubed. Now we're not working with grams or centimeters. We're working with kilograms and meters. So we really need to convert this one into basically the same term as the rho. We're given rho from our, our lookup table is 999.1 kilograms per cubic meter. 
Okay, so then we have this conversion. And I'll go ahead and tell you right now that the quick way to, to do this is to multiply specifically from grams per cubic centimeter. We can multiply that by a thousand. Rho P is essentially going to be on the same order as rho. So this is going to be the answer. Now, to get there, what you have to do is say 2.2 grams per centimeter. And then you'd want to multiply this by um, one, gram, uh, one kilogram per 1,000 grams and multiply that by um, one cubic meter per, um, oops, excuse me, wrong way, um, per one cubic meter, how many centimeters do we have? And essentially what we, what we need to do is say, um, so centimeter, we go from centimeter to meters is 100 centimeters, but then we need to cube that quantity, right? We, we need to cube the centimeters to get it to cubic centimeters. So what we can do, let, let me make this a little more clear. The process here, when you're converting cubed lengths or your squared lengths, what you want to do is you want to set up what you know, right? You have 100 centimeters in every meter. Then cube it, okay? When you cube one, it's still one. So you get one cubic meter, but you have to cube outside of the number here, right? You don't just convert without, without cubing this part. So you have to have 100 cubed. Um, so then that becomes like, what, 10,000 or 100,000, whichever one it is. Um, when you multiply all those together, you end up with the uh, answer right here. Okay, so that's, that's the process to, um, to do that conversion. And you end up with grams, kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, so given that we have these two parameters, we also know we were given, we'll put it right here, mu, because of the temperature, we can use the lookup table and get 1.14 times 10 to the minus third kilograms per meter per second. Put all of these things into here, into this equation, and I recognize there's one last thing we need. The diameter of the particle is given to us as 0 0.01 millimeters. Now, here we know that there's 1,000 millimeters per meter, just based on the SI prefixes. So that's going to be equal to, in meters, if we wanted to write it out this way, we have one, two, that many meters, right? If I did that right. So we need to move this three places to the left. We have one, and then three more places, yeah. Um, we could also say that's going to be equal to 1 times 10 to the fifth, minus fifth uh, meters. Okay, so then we put all those things in there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do this in Excel. I think that'll be a little easier than the calculator. Um, if you already have the answer, feel free to, to put it in the chat. But for now, what I'm going to do is use Excel. We'll make this a little bigger. Okay, so here we have 9.81 for gravity times the rho particle, 2200, minus the 999.1. Going to multiply this by that diameter of the particle squared. So 0 0.1234, the fifth one. Going to square that. All of this. We're going to divide it by 18 times that mu value, which was 0 0.1234. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. I missed the one there. So that's 1.14 times 10 to the minus third, and I did that just a little bit wrong. So 
0.00114 is the correct way to express that. Okay, then also meant to put that here. Okay, so then we get an answer, and it should be in meters per second, of exactly what you just wrote there for us, 5.74 times 10 to the minus fifth meters per second. Excellent. So we follow that. We put everything in. And here's our final answer for the what is the settling velocity of a particle. But exactly as you're just noting, the essentially what the case is this 5.7 is greater than um, oh wait a second no okay so let's take a look at this so 5.7 times 10 to the minus fourth meters per second this is our vs and our v naught we calculated to be um, 4.19 times 10 to the minus fourth so Oh, okay, you're right. I... Good call. I, I misspoke. That was supposed to be minus fifth. Yes, thank you. Okay, so that means that the this, the critical settling velocity is faster than the um, the settling velocity of a given particle. So exactly like you said. Therefore, it will not remove all of the particles. So no is the answer. Now, it will remove some of them, but not all of them. All right, so if there are any questions for this, um, absolutely chime in, ask away. If you, if you had uh, rewinded or if you had paused earlier and then catch up in a little bit, um, feel free to, to make a comment. Just specify that you're asking about the sedimentation problem. Um, if you did pause and are not not synced up as well at this moment. Okay, so I think that this slide was just coming back to, um, yes, in fact, I'll, I'll use this slide to do just that. So, okay, so if you got that, great. It's just, again, you it might help to think about it in terms of um, here's our V-naught, uh, the downward trajectory component is our V-naught here, and then we're looking at some particle, and if it turns out that the V naught has a higher magnitude, that means um, you know small arrow here or bigger arrow here. That means um, it's not falling as fast. So sounds like you got it. Okay, and I mentioned um, previously that uh, you know we can do circular, we can do rectangular. Um, it doesn't matter so much as long as we're looking at it in terms of how the particles are settling. So it, in the circular case, we look at it three-dimensionally and we'd say, okay, this is the height the particle has to settle. And we're going to look at them traveling some radius to the edge. And if we were to draw that, it also becomes a rectangle. And so the rectangle model um, fits for both. Now, from the aerial view, when, if you were to, let's say, fly over a city and you see a, some sort of a facility, you might see these clarifiers. A lot of times they'll be circular. You'll see circular clarifiers um, floating about. It's like the fish is going to eat. OK. So in terms of um, clarifiers in practice, it, it seems to me like there's a lot of wastewater treatment systems that will use these circular ones and maybe more often or more frequent for um, drinking water treatment plants to use the rectangular ones. I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe, maybe this, it's something to do with um, wastewater treatment plants are using the circular ones a little more often. Um, because they're collecting more solids and perhaps it's easier to collect from there. You can make a conical structure at the bottom and uh, pipe off the solids that way. Um, it's kind of a, an interesting thing. I might, might try to get a better answer for you that, about that. 
um, at some point. Um, there's a, a couple things that we can do um, for our sedimentation to make it to make it more practical or kind of advance the technology a little bit. Um, so one of the things that we can do is increase the surface area of, of the sedimentation um, basin. So you remember we have, we think about our sedimentation basins in three dimensions like this, right? We have kind of a, uh, a square box where we have dimensions like this. Now, one thing we could do, because we said earlier that that surface area at the bottom is really the most important component. That's what determines how much um, flow we can handle, for example. What we can do is we can add shelves, and this is what we call a high-rate settler, because now instead of having one area at the bottom, we kind of cheat the system, and now we have four times that amount of area. So this adds area, this adds area, this adds area, and we still have the area at the bottom, right? So we could, you know, presumably all those are about the same. So we, if we quadrupled our surface area, then, you know, what does that do to our V naught equation? That used to be Q over, um, Q over A, right? That's, uh, that was our equation for V naught. So in this case, if we multiply A times four, then that means this critical settling velocity term decreases by a factor of four. That's a good thing. That's a good thing because that will mean that we are settling slower particles. Um, we are capable of settling slower particles than we were able to before. So we will settle out more particles by doing this. Now, this is not always practical. Um, so let me just write that here. Lower V naught is good um, because we can settle more particles. Now, having these shelves, it's not always practical because if you are not careful, you might end up with a flow that's kind of kicking up debris and kicking up particles that you really want them to settle nicely um, and if you've increased your flow rate or if you have less space for it to flow through you can get some shearing or different things so and, and then you also have the problem of collecting the particles off of here without kicking them all up into solution so while they are created sometimes they're not always practical just from a design point um, so they're not actually um, implemented everywhere. Um, we'll say they're not used as, um, as often as kind of the, the standard type. But it's a kind of, it's a cool thing that you can do um, that certainly boosts the um, boosts the efficiency of your treatment in terms of how much surface area of the ground you need to occupy with your treatment steps. There's another type of sedimentation and, or, or not sedimentation, but a, another design for sedimentation reactors. And this is kind of an, an interesting one. And this one is what we call an upflow reactor. And it's an all or nothing approach. Um, now let me answer this question real quick. So theoretically, could you use a vacuum pump to increase the speed of sedimentation? Now, if you were talking about sedimentation in, in terms of like particles floating in air and you got rid of more air, then you have less drag and you have less buoyancy from the air itself. And in that case, a vacuum may may in fact um, increase the rate of sedimentation. Um, in terms of a, a water system, an aqueous system, if you were applying a vacuum, and I'm, I'm guessing you meant you're meaning to like pull downward, um, 
you, first of all, that water is going to have to go somewhere. So unless you're using a, a membrane or something to filter the water, in which case you're performing filtration, then you're not going to be able to, um, it's not, it's not possible physically to cause the, the water to move downwards and to the right at the same time, right? So it, you can't create, you can't, since water is not compressible, you can't have low pressure water. It's just going to be, um, you know, you, you can't depressurize it to decrease the amount of it there. Um, so that would work in a gas phase potentially, but not, not in a liquid, especially not liquid water. Um, hopefully that answers your question there. Um, but let me know if, if there's something else that comes up. So this upflow design, it's also not used very often. And really the cases where it is used, it's um, primarily when you have extra special things happening. And when I say extra special things, what I'm talking about is we're going to learn about that coagulation process that where we cause different particles to stick together and precipitate forming larger particles, forming maybe a, a blanket of kind of sludge particles that settles out a little faster, maybe catching other particles along the way. Um, so when we're talking about the upflow design, we're really kind of dealing with a slightly more advanced coagulation system that allows us to essentially collect a blanket of sludge going downwards um, that that makes this a little more effective. It's almost doing some filtration along the way. But the premise here is you have water flowing upwards through this reactor design instead of sideways. So the other ones we were looking at were sideways. This is not sideways. This is the flow direction is upwards. And this is probably going to be in a kind of a conical type of system, right? So this would be um, the area on top. Um, it doesn't have to be. It could certainly be a sort of a trapezoidal rectangle sort of system. Um, I think they're usually circular, um, but trapezoidal looking at that cross section. So we have water flowing upwards, and it's important that it gets wider at the top because that means the water is actually going to slow down as it nears the end. So if we have a velocity vector um, right here, and we'll say this is V1, by the time the water gets to the top, and then essentially what's happening is the water is getting collected off the surface of the top. So water is just pouring out along the edges up here. If we look at the velocity right here at the top, it's going to be smaller. So this velocity here is actually what we're going to define as our critical settling velocity. Now, this is the critical velocity because any particle that gets removed has to be falling at at least that amount in order to escape, or in order to not escape. So if the particle is simply the, the speed at which the particle is falling versus the speed at which the water is moving upward. So it's a, kind of a direct comparison here. So that's why it becomes all or nothing. If the particle is not falling fast enough, um, faster than the water is moving up over this, um, overtopping the system, then none of the particles will be removed. And, in the previous case where we had water moving to the side, it was like, okay, if a particle started at the bottom and just slowly made its way, you know, compare that to a particle that started at the top, that one's not removed, but this one that started way at the bottom is removed. In this case, if it's not moving fast enough, it's just never getting removed, right? So this is uh, really an all or nothing approach. And again, it's, if you have a system where you are causing the particles to stick together well enough, then maybe you have a um, preventing preventing them from a lot, being able to move at that speed. Um, you know, they're just falling too quickly. So not used super often. I think there's a few niche cases where it, it is used, but um, certainly not a lot.
So we're not really going to deal with this, um, this type of design much. Uh, I just wanted to introduce you to it, kind of show you what that was about, and describe it a little bit. All right. So the last concept I want to introduce here is really related to what we just mentioned. Um, can we find the percentage of particles removed in a traditional system? So here we're back to the uh, traditional case. If we know that we have some critical settling velocity, that would be, and I'm going to use a different color here. If we had a, a critical settling velocity that went to here, um, let me try to do that one more time. Let's pretend that's a straight line. So that would be our critical settling velocity, that trajectory. We have some particles that are missing it, right? So this is V naught, and these guys would be Vs. Now, this Vs is the same. We see that the same exact slope. We see they're parallel uh, to each other. And what's happening is one started lower than the other. Um, we can actually find out exactly how many particles are going to be removed as a fraction of the total if we assume that the particles are distributed throughout the whole water column. Okay, if there's an equal amount of particles throughout the whole water column, then, then this method works. So I'm just going to write this. Assume particles are fully distributed along the height, along the edge. So along the height of the um, water column. Okay, so if that's the case, which is what we're going to assume, then what we can see then is we have this amount of gap, right? This portion of particles. So no particles, uh, no particles started above the height of the reactor. So all of this water is going to be clean, essentially, and all the water that's above that. And then this amount of the water, we have particles escaping. You know, whatever particle is settling at this amount of time. And then anything that hits below that is, um, has been removed. So we can use some geometry here, some basic geometry, and say we've got two parallel lines. They're parallel because they're the same velocity. In this rectangle, we know that this height right here is going to be the same as the one down here. So let's call this something. Um, let's say H E for H escaping. So this is H E. And then everything below that, from here down, all of these are uh, removed. So we'll say the HR. Now the book doesn't use this HE, HR. I'm just drawing it up to be clear about what I'm talking about. So with that, we can actually uh, derive how many particles removed are, are removed because um, the proportion here is, you know, if we compare HE divided by HR, this is actually the same thing as saying um, the, let's see, if we just simply say HE divided by theta or divided by time of some sort and divide the top and the bottom that way, then it's, it's the same thing where we, we are allowed to do that. It's going to be the same proportion. So the proportions are really telling us something about um, how many particles are removed. Um, it's proportional to that height, which means it's proportional to the, uh, the difference in velocity. Okay, and maybe a better way to look at this would be 
um, instead of HE to HR, we could do HE to the height of the reactor. Okay, that proportionality also works. Um, so the point here is that we can look at this proportion and look at exactly how many are removed in this manner. So given that, we can say that the percentage of particles removed, P, is going to be equal to the S divided by the naught times 100%. Now here again, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, oh shoot, do I have this right? Is, do I have this backwards? And so let's think about this together. If, if we have a velocity of the particle that is smaller than the critical settling velocity, as we do in this case showing here, then our percentage is going to be, um, yeah, then only only some percent, not not 100%, but less is going to be removed. So that, that is correct. So remember, Vs is the one we measure or the one we determine based on knowing something about the particles. V0 is the state of the reactor. Now, sometimes we design the reactor for a specific type of particle. So sometimes we will relate these, but certainly not always. Um, a little note here, you can't have more than 100% of particles removed. That doesn't exist. That's not reality, right? So you can't remove greater than 100%. So if you do have a problem and I tell you to, um, I tell you to report P, um, it's going to be 100% when your calculation says it equals 200%, right? So when Vs is greater than V0, just put it to 100% because you can't remove more than 100% of the particles. Okay, so that gives us an equation and this one is given to you in your study sheet, um, equation sheet. So that's the pr proportion of particles removed and you could do it as a fraction and get rid of the percentage or you could give it as a percentage and, and include that part. Okay. Um, any questions or issues with that? Please let me know. All right, so if we're good there, uh, the next thing we're going to be doing is coagulation dosing. So we just covered sedimentation. This actually covers both primary and secondary. This is true for water, like for drinking water treatment and wastewater treatment, both systems use at least two sedimentation steps, almost always. Maybe there's some niche cases that we don't need it. Groundwater typically doesn't need it so much, um, but most surface water sources have uh, this type of setup and almost all, if not all, wastewater treatment is going to include using gravity for sedimentation in some way or another. Okay, so we have just over 10 minutes left. I'm not going to get too far into the coagulation, um, but I, I think I'll probably just stop with this slide even. But what I want to show you is, you know, we're talking about settling particles. And so I want to show you a size chart here about how big are the particles and, you know, what are we, what are we dealing with in terms of removing particles and what's that, what is that going to look like in terms of stuff that we're familiar with um, in our lives. So if we take a look at particle size in micrometers. So 1,000 micrometers, first of all, is one meter. So this category of rain goes up to one meter. Obviously, you don't have one meter rain droplets. But the point here is that maybe you have rain droplets that are you know, very large, and you can kind of see um, some uh, you could see it's some portion of a meter, maybe 0.1 meter or something. So keep in mind this is, um, oh, I'm sorry. I had a complete brain fart here. This is millimeters. So micro is times 10 to the negative six, right? So ignore everything I just said. That was very silly. So 
10 to the minus 6 meters, that means this is 1 millimeter, um, which is 10 to the minus 3rd meters, uh, so millimeters. Okay, that makes more sense now. A rain droplet can be 1 millimeter, right? 1 thousandth of a meter. Sorry, that makes sense. If you think about taking rain but having really, really fine rain, that's essentially, I know, right? That would be a... That'd be scary. <laughs> um, I think the world would end. That's uh, basically the sky is falling if the sky was water, right? Okay. Fun times. Okay, so then if you go smaller than that and you have mist, that's in a range of uh, something like 10, 50, um, I guess 50 to 200, 500 um, microliters. So we're talking less than a millimeter, getting to the point where we maybe could see an individual particle, but it's kind of uh, not so sure about that. If you think about a screen mesh from like a screen door or a, the screen on your windows, it's small enough to keep mosquitoes out, thankfully. So mosquitoes are going to be above this millimeter range. Um, but certainly you usually can see the individual cells, if you look closely enough, um, in the, that screen mesh. Human hairs you're very familiar with, and you probably also recognize that they vary in size in terms of their diameter. Um, some people have very fine hair, some thicker, and, you know, even myself, I know if I compare the hair on my arm to the hair on my head, maybe there's some differences, things like that. Um, so there's some range here, and it gets down to not quite one micrometer, um, some apparently is smaller than what you can actually see with your visible eye. Um, so our, our naked eye can see maybe down to 10 micrometers. That's, that's really kind of stretching it. Um, and then based on optics, we really can't see just because of the way light works, the wavelengths are too long. We can't actually visibly see much below somewhere around this range. Um, even with the highest power microscope, we're never going to use visible light to detect down there. So we have to use x-rays or some other light that has smaller, um, smaller wavelengths to give us that information and convert it to a visual representation. Okay, so pollens typically are range from just below the, the capability of the human eye, 10 micrometers, up a little above that. And so those are some of the kind of practical things that we might think of in our daily lives. Now, if we think about microorganisms and stuff we want to remove from water for the sake of water purification, bacteria have a pretty big range, all the way from 100 nanometers in size to up to 10 micrometers. Um, so there are actually a few bacteria that you might be able to see with your eyes um, without even a microscope. It would be very, very tiny, of course. Um, but that's kind of interesting. There are some like that. Algae can be quite large. There's also some uh, cyanobacteria that are quite small, and I think that's probably lumping both of those together. Technically, there's a difference there. Cyanobacteria are bacteria, and then algae proper are more plant-like in their cell structures. We have what we call cryptosporidium oocysts. These are essentially hardened um, cysts that this uh, pathogen, they form, they're more resistant to chlorine, they're difficult to get rid of. Um, Cryptosporidium and Giardia both um, behave that way. We're going to talk more about Cryptosporidium. There's a, a reading assignment that I will give to you with an associated quiz um, about a, a waterborne outbreak for Cryptosporidium in Milwaukee. So that was a one of the first times we recognized exactly what this is, and um, there were a few treatment problems going on, why that didn't get removed. Okay, so let's take just a moment and think back on the problem we just solved, the silt particles, right? Um, if we took a look at the silt particles, they were 0 0.01 millimeter silt particles. So that's actually going to be right here. Um, so 0 0.01 millimeter is 10 micrometer, and so the silt particles that we were looking at removing um, would fall kind of in this range. 
So quick per diem spores are smaller. Giardia cysts have some variability. Bacteria generally are smaller than that. And so if we think about sedimentation, the range we can do sedimentation with a, a pretty reasonable flow rate. Um, large particles are easy. They, um, if you remember, our equation has dp squared on top times the, the density, rho p minus rho, all of that. This squared means that the size of the particle is going to dictate how quickly it's falling. It's going to, the larger particles will, will fall faster. Now the density obviously matters too, but the, that size of the particle is very important. So if we, the, the next step in our, um, in our work is going to be looking at how to increase the diameter of the particles. Um, that will drive the, the settling um, much faster. You know, I should just leave this here. This was good. So G rho P minus rho DP squared. So that diameter of these particles is really important. If we have something that's like one micrometer or some smaller, there's really no chance we're, we're getting a decent settling velocity out of it, um, unless it's something crazy dense, maybe gold or something. Um, but it, when we can cause them to stick together and grow, that's really helpful. So that's going to be the next topic. Um, we're going to get into particle stability, why particles don't stick together, and how to cause them to stick together. Uh, so that'll all be next time. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. And Otherwise, that's all I've got for you today, so I'll just hang out for a moment, um, give you a better fish cam until um, just for a couple more minutes in case there are any questions. So otherwise, we'll talk on Tuesday, and have a good weekend. What's the value, the first value here in this guy? That's the good question that's going to be the um the g g is the uh, acceleration due to gravity in um on the earth so g let me draw a better one Is this what you're, yeah, so this is G, um, and I did not write it very well. <laughs> yeah, so th that's the same equation we derived last time that we've been looking at. So that's, uh, I just wanted to recall that because that's really what drives whether or not our sedimentation works. All right, well, I will catch you guys next time. Yeah, no problem. And the fish is apparently saying goodbye too. <laughs>